They stepped out on the sidewalk, and Colonel Jim called a stylish baroche, but Colonel Jack said, No, sir, none of your cheap John turnouts for me. I'm here to have a good time, and money ain't any object. I mean to have the nobiest rig that's going. Now here comes the very trick. Stop that yaller one with the pictures on it. <laughs> Don't you fret. I'll stand all the expenses myself. So Colonel Jim stopped an empty omnibus, and they got in, said Colonel Jack. Ain't it gay, though? Oh, no, I reckon not. Cushions and windows and pictures till you can't rest. What would the boys say if they could see us cutting a swell like this in New York? <laughs> Bye, George. I wish they could see us. <laughs> then he put his head out of the window and shouted to the driver, Say, Johnny, this suits me. Suits yours truly. You bet you. I want this shebang all day. I am on it, old man. Let him out. Make him go. We'll make it all right with you, Sonny. <laughs> the driver passed his hand through the strap hole and tapped for his fare. It was before the gongs came into common use. Colonel Jack took the hand and shook it cordially. He said, You twig me, old pard. All right, between gents, smell of that and see how you like it. And he put a $20 gold piece in the driver's hand. After a moment, the driver said he could not make change. Bother the change. Write it up. Put it in your pocket. Then to Colonel Jim, with a sounding slap on his thigh, Ain't it style, though. Hanged if I don't hire this thing every day for a week. The omnibus stopped and a young lady got in. <laughs> Colonel Jack stared a moment, then nudged Colonel Jim with his elbow. Don't say a word, he whispered. <laughs> Let her ride if she wants to. Gracious, there's room enough. It's just the best. <laughs> the... <laughs> <laughs> the young lady got out her portemonnaie and handed her fare to Colonel Jack. What's this for, said he. Give it to the driver, please. Take back your money, madam. We can't allow it. You're welcome to ride here as long as you please. But this shebang's chartered, and we can't let you pay a cent. The girl shrunk into a corner, bewildered. <laughs> An old lady with a basket climbed in and pre-offered her fare. Excuse me, said Colonel Jack. You're perfectly welcome here, madam, but we can't allow you to pay. <laughs> Set right down there, mum, and don't you be the least uneasy. Make yourself just as free as if you was in your turnout. Within two minutes, three gentlemen, two fat women, and a couple <laughs> of children entered. Come right along, friends, said Colonel Jack. Don't mind us. This is a free blowout, that he whispered to Colonel Jim. New York ain't no sociable place, I don't reckon, and ain't no name for it. <laughs> he resisted every effort to pass fares to the driver and made everybody cordially welcome. The situation dawned on the people, and they pocketed their money and delivered themselves up to covert enjoyment of the episode. Half a dozen more passengers entered. Oh, there's plenty of room, said Colonel Jack. Walk right in and make yourselves at home. A blowout ain't worth anything as a blowout unless a body has company. Then in a whisper to Colonel Jim, but ain't these New Yorkers friendly? And ain't they cool about it, too? <laughs> Icebergs ain't anywhere. I reckon they'd tackle a hearse if it was going their way. More passengers got in, more yet, and still more. Both seats were filled, and a file of men were standing up, holding on to the cleats overhead. Parties with baskets and bundles were climbing up on the roof. Half-suppressed laughter rippled up from all sides. Well, for clean out-and-out -out cheek, if this don't bang anything that ever I saw. I'm, no, I'm an engine, whispered Colonel Jack. A Chinaman crowded his way in. I weaken, said Colonel Jack. Hold on, driver. Keep your seats, ladies and gents. Just make yourselves free. Everything's paid for. Driver, rustle these folks round as long as they have a mind to go. Friends of ours, you know. Take them everywheres. 
And if you want more money, come to the St. Nicholas, and we'll make it all right. Pleasant journey to you, ladies and gents. Go it just as long as you please. It shan't cost you a cent. The two comrades got out, and Colonel Jack said, Jimmy, it's the so sociablest place I ever saw. <laughs> the Chinaman waltzed in as comfortable as anybody. If we'd stayed a while, I reckon we'd have some niggers. But George, we'd have to barricade our doors tonight, or some of these ducks will be trying to sleep with us. <clears throat> Chapter 47 Buck Fanshawe's Death The Cause Thereof Preparations for His Burial Scotty Briggs, the Committee Man He visits the minister. Scotty can't play his hand. The minister gets mixed. Both begin to see. All down again but nine. Buck Fanshawe as a citizen. How to shoot your mother. <laughs> the funeral. Scotty Briggs is a Sunday school teacher. Somebody has said that in order to know a community, one must observe the style of its funerals and know what manner of men they bury with most ceremony. I cannot say which class we buried with most eclat in our flush times the distinguished public benef benefactor or the distinguished rough, possibly the two chief grades or grand divisions of society honored their illustrious dead about equally, and hence no doubt the philosopher I have quoted from would have needed to see two representative funerals in Virginia before forming his estimate of the people. There was a grand time over Buck Fanshawe when he died he was a representative citizen. He had killed his man, not in his own quarrel, it is true, but in defense of a stranger, unfairly beset by numbers. He had kept a sumptuous saloon. He had been the proprietor of a dashing helpmeet, whom he could have discarded without the formality of a divorce. He had, a, he had a held a high position in the fire department and been a very Warwick in politics. When he died, there was great lamentation throughout the town, but especially in the vast bottom stratum of society. <clears throat> On the inquest, it was shown that Buck Fanshawe, in the delirium of a wasting typhoid fever, had taken arsenic, shot himself through the body, cut his throat, and jumped out of a four-story window and broken his neck. And after due deliberation, the jury, sad and tearful, but with intelligence, unblinded by its sorrow, brought in a verdict of death. <laughs> by the visitation of God, what could the world do without juries? Prodigious preparations were made for the funeral. All the vehicles in town were hired, all the saloons put in mourning, all the municipal and fire company flags hung at half-mast, and all the firemen ordered to muster in uniform and bring their machines duly draped in black. Now let us remark in parentheses, as all the peoples of the earth had representative adventurers in the Silver Land, and as each adventurer had brought the slang of his na nation or his locality with him, the combination made the slang of Nevada the richest and the most infinitely varied and copious that had ever existed anywhere in the world, perhaps except in the mines of California in the early days. Slang was the language of Nevada. It was hard to preach a sermon without it and be understood. Such phrases as, you bet, oh no, I reckon not, no Irish need apply, and a hundred others became so common as to fall from the lips of a speaker unconsciously. And very often, when they did not touch the subject under discussion, and consequently failed to mean anything. After Buck Fanshawe's inquest, a meeting of the short-haired brotherhood was held, for nothing can be done on the Pacific coast without a public meeting and an, and an expression of sentiment. Regretful resolutions were passed and various committees appointed. Among others, a committee of one was deputed to call on the minister, fragile, 
gentle, spiritual new fledgling from an Eastern theological seminary, and as yet unacquainted with the ways of the minds. The committee man, Scotty Briggs, made his visit, and in after days it was worth something to hear the minister tell about it. Scotty was a stalwart rough, whose customary suit, when on weighty official business, like committee work, was a fire helmet, flaming red flannel shirt, patent leather belt with spanner and revolver attached, coat hung over arm, and pants stuffed into boot tops. He formed something of a contrast to the pale theological students. <laughs> It is fair to say of Scotty, however, in passing, that he had a warm heart and strong love for his friends, and never entered into a quarrel when he could reasonably keep out of it. Indeed, it was commonly said that whenever one of Scotty's fights was investigated, it always turned out that it had originally been no affair of his, but that out of native good-heartedness he had dropped in of his own accord to help the man who was getting the worst of it. He and Buck Fanshaw were bosom friends for years and had often taken adventures potluck together. Mm. Adventurous potluck. On one occasion, they had thrown off their coats and taken the weaker side in a fight among strangers, and af after gaining a hard-earned victory, turned and found that the men they were helping had deserted early. <laughs> and not only that, but had stolen their coats and made <laughs> off with them. But to return to Scotty's visit to the minister, he was on a sorrowful mission now, and his face was the picture of woe. Being admitted to the presence, he sat down before the clergyman, placed his fire hat on an unfinished manuscript sermon under the minister's nose, took from it a red silk handkerchief, wiped his brow, and heaved a sigh of dismal impressiveness, explanatory of his business. He choked and even shed tears, but with an effort he mastered his voice and said in lugubrious tones, Are you the duck that runs the gospel mill next door? <laughs> Am I the, pardon me, I believe I do not understand. With another sigh and, half a, so and a half sob, Scotty rejoined, Why, you see, we are in a bit of trouble and the boys thought maybe you would give us a lift if we'd tackle you. That is, if I've got the rights of it, and you are the head clerk of the doxology works next door. <laughs> I have the shepherd in charge of the flock whose fold is next door. The witch? <laughs> the spiritual advisor of the little company of believers whose sanctuary adjoins these premises. Scotty scratched his head, <laughs> reflected a moment, and then asked, you rather hold over me, pard. I reckon I can't call that hand. Auntie and pass the buck. <laughs> How? I beg pardon. What did I understand you to say? Well, you've rather got the bulge on me. Or maybe we've both got the bulge, somehow. You don't smoke me, and I don't smoke you. You see, one of the boys has passed in his checks, and we want to give him a good send-off. And so the thing I'm on now is to roust out somebody to jerk a little chin music for us and waltz him through.